We are so grateful to have a collection of authors with us tonight. Uh, the first to discuss a book that's just come out, published by Great Coford Books, and we're grateful for their publishing. Lloyd, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, Cheryl Bruno was the co-author of the book Method Infinite, Freemasonry and the Mormon Restoration that came out three years ago? Two years ago. Just two years ago. <laughs> Uh, and that was her first book, and then just barely released, Come Up Hither to Zion, William Marks and the Mormon Concept of Gathering, uh, that, that she will be speaking about tonight. And as you hopefully understood from our email, we're actually having two different books talked about tonight. So the first one will be the William Marks biography. And then Cheryl, will also, who also edited this new book from Signature called Secret Covenants, New Insights on Early Mormon Polygamy. And she'll present about first the Marx book, then Secret Covenants. At that time, we'll also hear from one of its contributors uh, who's here with us tonight, uh, Claire Barris. Thank you so much for being here. Um, okay, so on top of Cheryl, we also have the co-author of the William Marks biography, which is John Dinger. His first book that was published, The Nauvoo City and High Council Minutes, edited um, by John Dinger, published by Signature Books. That was his first publication. Unfortunately, I'm sold out of these, but we can get more if you're interested. It's available at a great price of only $28.99, normally $49.95. Uh, John also edited the significant textual changes in the Book of Mormon. It's the first printed edition compared to the manuscript and to the subsequent major LDS printed, uh, yeah, LDS English printed editions. A very, very valuable piece right here if you're interested in the translation of the Book of Mormon. And then, as I already mentioned, he's the, the co-author of this new William Marks biography. So with that, I will shut up, except for to just say, if you need to use the restroom, it's down the hall by the drinking fountain. The code is 513. Uh, if you please turn off your phones so that we don't have any interruptions as um, the speakers speak. And we are recording this. And we'll post it on our website and on YouTube within a few days if all goes well. And we'll also have refreshments afterwards out in the hallway. So with that, I'll turn the time over to Cheryl. Well, can we start with John? Or start with John. Yeah. We'll start with John. Okay. Is that good? Sounds good. Sounds good? All right. Um, it is an honor to be here. I did one of these for my last two books. It's uh, one of the highlights of, of uh, doing this. Uh, but beyond that, I used to actually work here. So if you, if you came in on Saturdays between 03 and 05, somewhere in there, 04, 06, uh, I may have sold you a book. Mm -hmm. And now the Vinches are very smart people because it was absolutely a scam. <laughs> not only did I not make any money, I actually spent more. <laughs> so if he offers you a job, <laughs> Think long and hard. Uh, so in the early 2000s, I edited the Nauvoo High Council and City Council Minutes. And so for those of you who are familiar uh, with that work, it is it's exactly what it sounds. It's the minutes of the High Council and the City Council. And one is supposed to be ecclesiastic, one is supposed to be secular, uh, but as all things in Nauvoo, they were very, very mixed. And as I worked on that, uh, we saw all the regular names, but there was one name that really stuck out to me. Someone who, as weird as it sounds, looking at you know city council documents, someone who really came out as sort of a hero, uh, and that was William Marks. So for those of you who don't know a lot about him, hopefully you will purchase this book and learn quite a bit, but I'm gonna fill you in here a little bit anyway. So he was actually one of the most respected and influential men in Nauvoo. Uh, but it's very possible that many of you really have not heard much about him. Uh, he was the stake president and uh, presided over the high council. And it was in this role that he helped form the city from the ground up and saw firsthand how polygamy, both authorized and unauthorized, affected the church. Also, he was a member of the city council. And as that, he served as a municipal judge. 
and in this capacity he continued to set up and run Nauvoo. Uh, he was also involved in many legal cases, uh, many involving Joseph Smith as a party, and he was a member of two secret groups, the Quorum of the Anointed and the Council of Fifty. Uh, but because of his opposition to polygamy, and because of your opposition to polygamy, I guess what you could maybe term is opposition to the Twelve, uh, he was written out of history uh, and has had his significance greatly minimized. He's been labeled an apostate, an enemy, and oddly, even a murderer. Uh, now, none of that is, is quite true, and we'll, we'll get into that. But he was born in Vermont in 1792, uh, moved to New York by 1821 with his wife, Rosanna, where he joined the Presbyterian Church in 1822. And they were active in that church and, and participated. And he was respected in it. Sometimes the meetings were at his home and he participated in some excommunications. Uh, they would excommunicate you for some uh, not too serious of things. But you'll see that excommunication and gathering is sort of a theme that went throughout his life. Uh, in an 1834 meeting in the Mark's home, uh, he testified that a fellow member had purchased alcohol from them too often uh, and that. But shortly thereafter, uh, he joined the LDS Church sometime between May and September of 1834. And on November 3rd, 1834, uh, the Marx family actually ended up getting excommunicated from that Presbyterian church. And here's what they were charged with. People did not like this back in the day. Uh, the violation of their covenant obligations by joining the sect commonly called Mormons. The treating of the ordinance of baptism in this church as though it had no validity and consequently with contempt. The treating of the church as if it were not the church of Christ, and in fact rejecting it, by meeting with a sect which professes not to fellowship us as a church. Representations of this import, uh, that, that ignorance and prejudice are the grand reason why the members of sessions and other members of the church do not become Mormons. And then finally, a belief in the following erroneous sentiments or delusions. One, that some of the Mormons have the gift of unknown tongues, that the Mormons have immediate revelation from God, that some of the Mormons have the gift of healing and of prophecy, and that some of the Mormons have the gifts of the interpretation of tongues, that the extraordinary gifts of the Holy Ghost are essential to the purity and perfection of the church, and that all wicked things among the Mormons are brought to light by the immediate revelation from God. And so, while that's what they were excommunicated for, that is clearly what the marks were drawn toward, right? That revelation, that healing, those tongues, like so many of the early church. Well, Marx eventually moved to Kirtland, where he communed with the saints, and due to his abilities, he was very quickly uh, called as a member of the High Council. Uh, and it was there that he, again, participated in many church hearings. We, again, we see that gathering and that, those excommunications. Uh, he eventually ended up in Nauvoo with the other saints, where he was called the state president, and he presided over the Nauvoo High Council. And this body, uh, as it was set up and developing, uh, at one meeting on July 11th, 1840, Joseph Smith came and put some procedures in place for these hearings that had to be held before the High Council. And here's what he added. Uh, Joseph added that the Council should try no case without both parties being present or having had an opportunity to be present. Neither should they hear one party's complaint before his case is brought up for trial. And neither should they suffer the character of any one to be exposed before the Council without the person being present and ready to defend him or herself. And those were in addition to doc the Doctrine and Covenants sections that talked about the High Council, where it was made very clear that you had to have somebody speak in behalf of the accused. I'm going to get to hear that in a minute, why that's important. So Marx would make sure that these rules were followed as he presided over trials in Nauvoo, and preside he did. Uh, he was present for and presided over many of the trials dealing with John C. Bennett and Bennett's spiritual whippery and other cases of non-authorized and maybe a few authorized polygamy cases. But to kind of get back to my original statement about Marx and how he really stuck out to me uh, was because of his actions after the mar martyrdom. And what really came through was his integrity. Uh, after the martyrdom, Emma, William Clayton, Alpheus Cutler, and Reynolds Calhoun all believed that Marx should succeed Joseph in running the church, Emma among the top of them. Uh, there was actually a prayer circle meeting at the Marks home on July 4th, 1844, where Clayton initially recorded that, quote, it seems manifest to him, and then that Alpheus Cutler, Reynolds Carhoon, 
quote, the brother Mark's place is to be appointed president and trustee in trust, and this accords with Emma's feelings. Uh, however, uh, not believing that he was the proper successor and being an opponent to polygamy, uh, he, that didn't happen. Uh, but what to me is important here is it shows that he never believed he was supposed to be it, and he didn't push for it. Had he really pushed for it in those days before the 12 came back to Nauvoo, he likely would have been the president of the church. Now, Sidney Rigdon did believe that uh, he was the proper successor and made that push, and he was rebuffed by Brigham Young and the 12 apostles. Sides were drawn, accusations made, debates were had, and Marx fell somewhere in the middle. And on August 8, 1844, it all came to a head at that meeting where Rigdon and Young put forth their claims and the people voted. Uh, this was the meeting where uh, the supposed transfiguration of Brigham Young occurred. And it was actually Marx who had called for this meeting. And as history has shown, the majority of the people went with the 12 apostles. And after the vote was taken, uh, we kind of see Young starting to turn on Marx. Uh, after this meeting um, and the vote had been taken, he said, Brigham Young said to the crowd, the next is President Marx, and our, feeling are, and our feelings are to let him stand as president of the stake as heretofore. So with this statement, Young was letting uh, Marx know that he is no longer uh, in charge and he is serving at the pleasure of the 12 apostles. So a short time later, uh, rumors started to spread that Marx was not willing to follow the 12. Uh, he was accused by Clayton of, quote, trying to draw off a party and was summoned to appear before the 12 apostles the following day at the temple. <clears throat> and this episode set off a chain of events where Marx had to keep coming in to the 12 and telling them, no, I am loyal, I will follow you. Uh, he had to sign papers to that effect. Um, but in one of these meetings, Marx, he stood up for himself. Uh, Young led the meeting and he told Marx that, quote, that in consequence of rumors and reports of proceedings of him and Elder Rigdon, he had called them together that the thing might be talked over and if possible, a union effected. Young then told Marx, quote, what he had heard, uh, likely that the rumors that Rigdon and Marx were planning on forming a church in, com uh, in competition with the 12. So Marx not only denied the charges in toto, but he also claimed that, quote, he had been accused by the tongue of slander. At this point, Marx had no intention of resigning. You could tell he was frustrated and fed up uh, but he had no intent of leaving the church either. He believed in uh, the revelations of Joseph Smith and that uh, what he had been taught. And so uh, he does, he did tell the 12 though, that, that what was his problem was he acknowledged that the course of the 12 had pursued, I'm sorry, he acknowledged that the course the 12 had pursued was contrary to what he had expected. Marx, uh, re sorry, resented the way that the 12 were asserting their authority since the death of Joseph Smith. And so his challenge actually, for a short time, cleared the air by putting this kind of out there, talking about the elephant in the room. And so for that time, he was able to sort of navigate uh, the difficult situation with integrity, and the meeting was ultimately pronounced beneficial. Uh, Repitton Clayton stated that in regard to Marx, he, quote, would never listen to reports again. Uh, sadly, this um, temporary peace didn't last, and it was shattered. So on September 8, 1884, uh, that is when the High Council, when I say High Council, but it was really the 12 apostles, uh, cut off or excommunicated uh, Sidney Rigdon in a public meeting in Nauvoo. And so minutes of the meeting state that the High Council was organized with Bishop Newell K. Whitney at their head. And now how that occurred, I don't know, because bishops don't stand at the head of High councils, the state president does. But they had cut uh, William Marx out. Uh, Marx, he should have been at the head. Uh, but nonetheless, this meeting was an absolute pile on. Uh, Brigham Young, who was not a member of the High Council, uh, nonetheless ran this uh, proceeding as sort of both a witness and a prosecutor. And he, none of the procedures and rules were followed that day. Uh, Orson Hyde, Young, Harley P. Pratt, Massa Lyman, John Taylor, W. W. Feltz, and Heber C. Kimball all testified against Rigdon. And so while the meeting was conducted under unusual circumstances, Marx did make, he did his best to make sure that it was carried out according to the High Council rules, according to those revelations that Joseph Smith had given that he believed in. And this really ended up to being to his own detriment. After watching what was happening, 
and hearing all the claims made against Rigdon, especially ones that Marx believed were irrelevant, like things that had happened back in Missouri, Marx followed the high council protocols by personally offering a defense of Rigdon. So when all this was going on, he stood and said, I will take up the opposite side. And he said he did this because he had always been a friend to Rigdon, and because according to the revelations, somebody from the high council was to, quote, stand up in behalf of the accused. And so in doing this, Marx must have known that to defend Rigdon in a public meeting would put him at even more at odds with the 12 than he had been at that point. But nonetheless, Marx did what he felt was right and offered a defense. And it was a defense. Uh, he, he really went at it. Uh, he countered many of the apostles' arguments, which set in motion his treatment and eventual expulsion from Nauvoo. And so it was at this hearing where he stood up to those in power because he was loyal to Joseph Smith and to the Revelations. And that is what really stuck out to me when I was editing these Nauvoo High Council and City Council minutes. And I thought, I need to learn more about him. But there wasn't a lot out there. And so uh, after that, uh, I'm kind of a slow mover. Uh, I researched and gathered documents, sources, anything I could. I also published a few articles on him. I would speak on him at different conferences, MHA, Sunstone, uh, those places. In the early part of the pandemic, uh, on a Facebook uh, page, uh, people were kind of talking about what they were working on. And Cheryl and I realized that we both had plans to write a biography of him. And thank goodness, Cheryl was willing to combine forces with me. Uh, like I said, I was a bit out of steam. I'm a slow mover. And Cheryl has enough energy, uh, not just for two people, but for three. She had the energy and determination to really make sure that this got done. And so I will forever be grateful for her uh, for that. Uh, but the book that we produced, we really hope it brings justice to William Marks. We hope people now learn and know more than just one or two things about him. And we hope that it fills that gap in Mormon history that needs to be filled. Thank you. John, that was a fabulous synopsis of how you came to be working on William Marks and uh, of really of his life. And what I'd like to focus on tonight is a little bit about power dynamics in Mormonism. And I wonder if any of you out here in the audience have encountered power <laughs> dynamics in Mormonism. Kind of nod your head if you have. <laughs> I see a lot of nods out there. So it's very interesting to look at power dynamics in Mormonism through the lens of William Marks. And it starts from really um, the very first time that we encounter William Marks in the Presbyterian Church. And John and I were really excited when we dug up these Presbyterian records because before this time we had a little bit on William Marks um, but starting really with his baptism in the church and we didn't know about his life before that so it was really interesting to see um, how he worked in the Presbyterian Church and what happens was he and his wife Rosanna moved to Portage New York uh, at that time it was ca called Nunda New York and um, some cousins of Rosanna's were charter members of this one Presbyterian church in Nunda. And I guess they influenced Rosanna to come into the church and get some of her children baptized. Mm -hmm. And uh, William Marks did not join until uh, a little while after, almost a year after Rosanna had been a member of this Presbyterian church. But right away, he um, was seemed to be very respected and had a little bit of power. I think he also had a little bit of money, and often they met in his house, which was one of, probably one of the larger houses, and that's why um, the meetings were held there. So um, he did yet, he did have some like authority, as John was telling you, authority to um, pass judgment on people who were, for example, drinking too much or whatever. So. Um, so that, with that's, I think, his first encounter with ecclesiastical authority was in the Presbyterian Church. But then, as John mentioned, he became um, introduced to the Mormon Church. This, again, I think through a woman, because his sister was and her family were the first to encounter the Mormons. They lived um, across the street from Warren Cowdery, or 
adjacent to Warren Cowdery and were introduced to the Mormon missionaries and um, William Marks somehow, we don't know quite how, but somehow he heard about it and attended meetings with um, his sister, I guess, I guess his sister's name is Prudence Miles, and he attended meetings and joined the church. And something about him was just so stable and so steady that he immediately again um, was made um, in, put in charge of um, one of the branches that was there in the Freedom Conference in New York. And we have one of the records in Freedom Conference where William Marks appeared and actually represented three different branches there in New York and gave the report of how those branches were doing. So this is the first um, intimation that we have in the Mormon Church that he had some authority there. Then he was made an elder and very soon afterwards moved to Kirtland. And right away in Kirtland, we have a little, we know that in Kirtland, things were um, in flux a lot. Of, um, we have financial troubles in Kirtland, we have um, spiritual troubles in Kirtland. And here comes William Marks, he was a little bit older in, her, in his 40s. And sometimes we don't realize how young Joseph Smith was and many of his followers are so young. And William Marks was this older, respected person. And so he was given charge of the messenger and advocate. He was given charge of many of the properties there in Kirtland, including the Kirtland Temple. So he, um, I think that one of the reasons why these properties were given to William Marks was because Joseph Smith was being, um, um, people were going after Joseph Smith for debts, to collect debts. And if he owned these properties, then that could, those could be taken away from him to pay the debts. So he put the properties in William Marks's name and um, that way he didn't, William Marks could control this without having uh, the properties taken away from him. And the same thing with the temple, he wanted to preserve the temple. But with the bank failure and many things that were happening there, um, gradually all the people started moving to Missouri as we know there was revelations that um, that people should start moving to Missouri and so William Marks helped people um, tie up their affairs and um, move on to Missouri and he was one of the very last to leave Kirtland many people think that he did not follow Joseph Smith's revelation to move to Missouri but he did just he was one of the last people and when he arrived in Missouri he was there to probably close to the very day that the Mormons were kicked out of Missouri so he gathered up his family and they went to Warsaw and gradually the church came together into commerce which became Nauvoo um, William Marks was made the first state president. I, I forgot to tell you he was state president in Kirtland and also on the high council in Kirtland as well. So he had this ecclesiastical authority there in those places. And when they began in the swampy, marshy country of commerce and started building it up, William Marks was the president of the state and the president of the high council there. That first year and a half to two years, they did not have a, um, a city council or any way to, um, to control the citizens. And so what they did was they had the church. If somebody stole your nails, you went to the high council. You know, you went to the, the president of the high council or you brought it before the high council instead of um, you had no legal recourse. And so William Marks and the high council heard many of these cases you know, he, he took too much wood. You know, he took the lumber that was supposed to be for, you know, marked for this, or, you know, so-and-so's taking too many nails, or someone has stolen my this or that. Um, and so these are many of the first cases that William Marks presided over, um, uh, whether a uh, strong drink was going to be sold and, you know, that kind of thing, how much could be sold. So um, we see William Marks, and his position of authority as the president of the high council there, um, as someone who 
was not very authoritarian, but rather worked with people. And I think he tried to get people to make compromises with each other during that time. And then after that period of maybe two years, um, they did develop a city council, a mayor, a city council, and um, aldermen, and William Marks was involved in the city council as well. And he was also on the board of the University of Nauvoo. He was just about in everything when um, a group of people came together to make a Masonic Lodge, he was one of the first to apply to become a, a Mesa, a Freemason in Nauvoo. So um, we see him as a strong leader, and, but a very benevolent leader as well. He wasn't um, a very patriarchal um, um, leader where he uh, threw his authority around, but he was soft-spoken and he isn't even, in many of the minutes of the High Council, although he was present, he doesn't seem to have spoken out a lot on, on these issues. So he was, I think, just very kind, benevolent, very well respected by almost everyone. So um, I think John told you a little bit about the, after Joseph Smith's death and the succession crisis that we had, um, and William Marks was basically forced out of Nauvoo. And uh, I think it was a relief to Brigham Young. He makes a statement of William Marks has left without being whittled out. So they didn't have to threaten him to leave, but um, they did kind of give him a hard time. And so he leaves and he goes to Fulton, Illinois, which is just up the river. And uh, at the time, Emma Smith was having difficulty too. So she took her family and also went to Fulton, Illinois for a time before she moved back to Nauvoo. Soon, William Marks discovers that there is another uh, sect growing um, to succeed Joseph Smith, and this is James Strang. And he was a very interesting character and a good um, alternative to Brigham Young for many of the people that lived in the Midwest because he, at, at the first, when he started his sect, he did not um, practice polygamy and didn't preach polygamy. So all the people who didn't agree with Brigham Young's polygamy, you know, went to, to James Strang. He was also um, very sympathetic towards women, towards racial issues, and um, he was rather um, forward thinking for his day. So a lot of people joined with James Strang, and William Marks was one of them, many of the Smith family as well. And immediately, William Marks with his cachet as stake president, as uh, president of the High Council, uh, was made a leader in James Strang's church right away, the minute he joined. He was a bishop, he later became a, an apostle in Strang's organization, and so um, he, I think, we see just a little bit of hesitation, however, from Marx, although he holds these positions of authority, he doesn't move to Voree or to Beaver Island, those two centers of James Strang's organization. He doesn't gather with the saints. He stays in the place that he's found in Shabona Grove, and he builds up his businesses, he builds up his finances, he becomes a well-respected man in town, and he stays there while occasionally going to conferences with James Strang. Um, eventually, you'll have to read in our book what happens that, um, that makes him leave the Strangites, but there are changes in Strang's organization, and William Marks gradually decides that he is no longer, feels comfortable there. And so he leaves that organization, kind of looks around for a little while, and finds another man who has taken the place in the restoration movement of a prophet. And this is Charles Thompson. I don't know if any of you have heard of Benemiites, the Benemis, some people called them. And they're in the direction of Charles Thompson, who um, also was very interesting, interested in finding a gathering place for the saints. And he as well found that it was advantageous to his movement to use William Marks as one of his um, strong leaders in the church. So he makes him one of the highest leaders in the church, and he also puts him on a committee to find a gathering place 
for these saints, this group of Midwest saints. And so William Marks looks here and there. He finally finds a place um, where Brigham Young had had a group of people gather in Council Bluffs before they went off to, um, to the West. There were still some uh, rudimentary dwelling places there. And at first William Marks thought this would be a great place so we'll use this little community that they've already built up and now abandoned and maybe we can start our gathering place here. So he's very instrumental in finding a place for the saints to gather. Almost um, right away when they start to move into Council Bluffs, somebody um, decides that maybe a little bit further over is a better place. So they don't actually gather in Council Bluffs. They gather in a place that they named Preparation. And they started gathering there. And then Charles Thompson seems to just go nuts. He starts... Um, <laughs> He starts asking them for um, mostly money, you know, more money than he has a, um, a consecration in the United Order, but it seems very strict and very hard for the people. They found it was very difficult. And so William Marks, um, with his level head, says, well, we have this gathering place. Let's just send one person of a family to go and build it up first before we just kind of all just flush in there like we did in Missouri. Um, but let's send one person of a family, they can build the house, they can make it all ready for their people, and um, I will get a sawmill, I'll get, you know, these things, the lumber, um, because there wasn't much lumber in the place. So he started building it up for the people, and he prepared to move himself out there. But when he got there, what he found were people that were very disgruntled, and they were angry about this money, and, um, Charles Thompson gave him a hard time because he was not giving all his money to the church. And so that's when he decided, this isn't for me, and he left that movement as well. So William Marks was really a seeker. He loved the Restoration Church. He loved uh, the Book of Mormon. He loved Joseph Smith. And so he couldn't quite give up his search. And so for a few years, he looked around and couldn't find anything. So now we're talking about we're talking about power and authority in the church. He wondered if he should himself because there's there were people just all over the Midwest who had no leader. He thought, well, maybe I should gather together some of these people and start something. And he just kind of agonized about it. So he met with these few people. He met with these few people. He wrote letters to these few people, but he never kind of got it rolling. However, um, what's what they called the reorganization did get a movement rolling, which they thought should be headed by um, a son of Joseph Smith. They wanted Joseph Smith III to come and join them. So they made some overtures to Joseph Smith III, and he was not interested. He said, no, I, I really don't want to have anything to do with that. He had some bad experiences as a boy, and he did not think he wanted to. But when he found out that William Marks was interested in that, and that William Marks had now joined the church, he decided that he would step forward as their next leader. And he wrote a letter to William Marks saying, I have decided now that I am going to um, become their next leader. Will you come and see me and help you know, facilitate this? So William Marks was the one that facilitated Joseph Smith III's entry into the reorganized church as their president and prophet. And he, be, he ordained Joseph Smith III as their prophet, and he became the first counselor for the rest of his life. He was the first counselor to Joseph Smith III, and um, the first and only counselor. So it was just Joseph Smith III and William Marks who led that church for the first years that it, um, that it came to pass, so. Um, now, Chris. How are we going to make the transition to our second? Do questions at the end? Yeah, let's see. We'll have questions, questions about William Marks. Okay, that would be good. So we have John and I would be glad to answer questions about this book to anyone that has them or about William Marks' life. Gary. So this cuts across both William Marks and polygamy. Uh, one of the things that William Marks is maybe most famous for in Mormon history 
is his assertion that Joseph Smith told him that he, Joseph Smith, had made a mistake in introducing and practicing polygamy. Would you comment on that? Do you believe that Joseph Smith told him that? Um, do you want to start? You start. And sure. Let's go. So, you know, Cheryl used to, when we would talk in these conferences, she'd say, "Who knows more than three things about Joseph Smith?" And nobody did. Or I'm sorry, three things. William Marks. William Marks. <laughs> and nobody did. The one thing that people did know was this 1853 letter where Joseph Smith, where William Marks talks about this meeting. Uh, two to three weeks before the martyrdom, Joseph came to him and said, I have been deceived, poor ruined people, uh, referred to polygamy as a curse, uh, asked William Marks to um, go in front of the high council and cut these people off or we'll have to leave the United States. Uh, and so one of the things that you'll find as you read this is that forever that one version has been quoted, but Cheryl and I have, have, abs have actually found five versions of this, that he actually told it five different times over 16 years. He was always very consistent uh, in how he said it. Um, and so as, as you really look at, when you take his, his statement and you put it up against um, what was going on, this was right around the time um, where Joseph Smith had a lot going on and didn't have any polygamous support. The 12 were all out of Nauvoo. Um, campaigning for him as president. This was the time when Joseph Smith got indicted, where the Nauvoo Expositor was now making this polygamy public. Uh, and so he needed, he really truly needed some support. And so that's when he turned to William Marks and did this. And so did the meeting happen? 100%. I, I think we very clearly show that this happened. The second part is, did Joseph Smith mean it? And, and that's <laughs> speculation, and honestly, I don't think he did. I think he was trying to buy time until polygamist allies like the 12 were back in town. So we have some statements of Joseph Smith, um, particularly in William Clayton's journal, where he says, if you get caught for polygamy, I'll just go ahead and excommunicate you, and then I'll bring you in the back door, basically. So um, I think maybe it's a possibility that Joseph Smith was telling William Marks, will you stand up there as president of the High Council, excommunicate all these people, and then publicly we'll be okay, and then maybe later we can bring them in the back door. So that's just kind of my speculation of what he was telling William Marks. I do not know if William Marks was aware of that or not, whether William Marks thought he really wanted him to, to excommunicate all of the, the people who were practicing polygamy, um, or if he was kind of in on it. Um, we have someone in here who is probably <laughs> rolling their eyes at me because <laughs> perhaps um, we can take a statement to mean that Joseph Smith was very serious that he did want to excommunicate all of the polygamists. So it's you can read the statement many different ways. And so what I like to do is I like to put this statement with another statement he made later when he was the first counselor for Joseph Smith III. And he was meeting with the Council of the Twelve of the RLDS Church. And they asked him specifically, did Joseph Smith practice polygamy? And his reply was, Hiram Smith was concerned and wanted to know the truth and went to Joseph got this revelation, BNC 132, and brought it before the High Council. And that's when William Marks learned about it. So he testifies that he saw um, Hiram Smith talk about polygamy and Joseph's polygamy. And so that statement is a little harder to, um, to um, what's the word? Dismissed. Dismissed, very good. Um, also, at the time, William Marks did not have um, he wanted to please Joseph Smith III and those who were against polygamy. So he was not someone who was for Brigham Young and didn't have a motivation for saying that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. So um, it's a it's a statement that rings very true. So Gary, did you are you are you saying that William Mark says that he did not hear about polygamy before the uh, the revelation? No, I'm not saying that, but he does say when he's asked point blank if Joseph Smith practiced polygamy, he talks about the High Council meeting where DNC 132 was introduced. Okay. He doesn't say that that was the first he had heard but, of but it. But he, do you, do you believe that he believed in each of those three, uh, five recitals 
that Joseph Smith was abandoning polygamy? Yeah, we don't know if he believed he was abandoning polygamy or if they were, that was the, um, that was what they were going to be doing to appear to be abandoning polygamy. But, but, but you both study William Marx. Yes. Would he do that? But would he do what? Would, would he participate in a uh, kind of a parsing of uh, polygamy statements? Or, or, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Mm -hmm. so, so would he be disingenuous? I do. I believe that or? he was very loyal to Joseph Smith, and um, although he was uh, not the type of person that would be disingenuous, I think his loyalty to Joseph Smith would probably have overridden that. I don't know if John agrees. So I, he was not a polygamist, right? Absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. No. He was not. Uh, he, it, if you read that statement, uh, Joseph Smith also says, you're one of the only leaders who's not. That's why he came to him. Um, I, I, this is one part where we disagree a tiny bit. I, I read those statements as very clearly um, Joe Smith saying he's a polygamist. Uh, later on, um, one of these five accounts, uh, there's one where he talks to a, a missionary, Mark Forskett, where he recounts this, but at the beginning of it, Mark Forskett just flat out asks, um, was Joseph a polygamist? And Mark says, yes, he and John C. Bennett were the first to go into it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you can parse out and, and kind of play with the different accounts, but we, when you look at them as a whole, I, I, I see them, I think, a little stronger than Cheryl does. I think we had one. <clears throat> Do you think it's possible that William Marx misunderstood Joseph Smith? Because I know some that thinks they actually know that he misunderstood here in the 21st century. Actually, I don't know if they have clairvoyant powers or what. <laughs> but do you think that William Marx misunderstood Joseph Smith? So first of all, I want to talk about the people who think they know. I think that John and I can stand before you as the probably foremost authorities that will, of William Marx at, the, at this time. Okay, I don't know of anyone else. Seriously, I do not know of anyone else who knows William Marx better than we do. Um, and that's not being, you know, a very humble person, but, uh, but yes. Um, so people that say, oh, I know this about William Marx, I know that about William Marx, I would like to see their documentation. I do not believe they have any documentation that we have not studied. So when they say they know, uh, or sometimes people have a spiritual witness, which is very different in a, in a religious um, way they know this. Is that what they're talking about? I'm not entirely sure. They just think, thought that he was mistaken, that just hit him hard. Right. Oh, that Marx basically was too stupid to know what Joseph Smith right. was Right, so Marx was about. absolutely not a stupid person. And I think when he has these five different accounts that are very well put together, we have one of them in his own handwriting in a letter. So I think I believe that William Marx actually had this experience with Joseph Smith. I mean, I, I gave a half an hour presentation on this. I, we're not giving you the whole context, but if you, if you look at what was going in, in Nauvoo at the time, it, it is absolutely clear that, uh, no, he didn't misunderstand. And this is all in your in the book. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Maxine. Well, I had the same question and, and a follow up question to that because this Marx account is so crucial. It's such a crucial historical uh, piece to the whole polygamy conundrum and question about what was going on in other. And so this is kind of a follow up question, probably asking for conjecture. But I'm just wondering, along with the fact that Marx gives this statement. Um, and along with what appear to be very different versions that Joseph is telling different people at that same time. I mean, you've got everything from the Martha Brotherton account to all of these different accounts. Do you think, and again, maybe I'm asking for conjecture, but do you think that, do you have any speculation about why Joseph would tell Marx <coughs> this? Is he the only one who, he, who Joseph gives this version of the story to and and do you think that what Joseph is telling Marx is just as true, maybe for Joseph, as the other things he's telling other people? Do you have any thoughts about why, why he would pick Marx to be the one who he 
gives this confession to when he's telling different people different stories? That's a complicated question. <laughs> yes. I'm going to ultimately point you to the book. But there, there's a lot going on where Marx would be the one he went to talk to. Marx was in every group except for the 12 apostles. I mean, he was formally anointed. Uh, Council of 50, all these. Some of the things that, that went on uh, that I'm kind of alluding to and I could talk about for two hours are um, in the May grand jury of uh, Hancock County, William Marks was on the grand jury that indicted Joseph Smith hmm. for polygamy. So William, or William Marks actually indicted him, did his duty on the grand jury, came back to Nauvoo, told him about it, hmm. said we indicted you. Hmm. Uh, all of that, and so it makes sense that that. But then, but then also, William Marks served as his bondsman, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. put himself up as as a bondsman for these crimes, and so it, it, there were not a lot of people uh, around this time. Also, Robert Foster wanted to meet with Joseph, and Joseph thought he's going to murder me, so he said, "Let's each bring four people with us," and one of those four was William Marks, mm -hmm. and then William Marks also wielded. A lot of influence. Yeah. If William Marx could stand up and actually do something about this, that could quell the rumors. That could mm -hmm. could mm -hmm. could counteract the Nauvoo Expositor. Uh, all of that kind of stuff. So William Marx really, at the time, was the one person you would go to mm -hmm. if you were Joseph Smith. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Michelle, I, I'm just wondering. So I assume you reject. I think it was Edmund C. Briggs who said that Marx told him that he was deceived in the brethren. That Joseph said he was deceived in the brethren, not that he was deceived about polygamy. Because that's where that interpretation comes from, that, that William Marks was saying that. So, and then I have another part to that question. So there is a much later account by um, William Briggs. Is it William Briggs? I thought it was Edmund. Edmund, Edmund Briggs, yes. sorry. There are two of them. <laughs> OK, so yeah. Edmund Briggs um, gives an account of, he says that he spoke to William Marks at, um, at some point in 1906. Um, yeah, so, um, and he's telling the story, and much later, and he is kind of, uh, he's not, uh, he has a point to prove for the RLDS church, and so what he's trying to say is that William Marks is, William Marks said that when he said he was deceived, he was saying he was deceived okay. in the brethren. Right, so, so Joseph was deceived when he was saying, I'm I was deceived to be practicing polygamy, that he wasn't actually, it wasn't actually Joseph practicing polygamy, but he had been deceived by others who were practicing polygamy. So when we investigated this account, um, we found that even though Briggs is um, acting like it's coming from his journal, when we go back to his actual journal that was written closer to the time, um, he does not even say in that journal on that particular day that he even met with William Marks. So it's either a very, very late remembrance of what William Marks told him, or it's being made up. Mm -hmm. So um, where, whereas on the other side, we have many um, accounts that William Marks, what he actually said and what he wrote with his own hand that counter that so, particular. So then would your interpretation be that Joseph was asking William to excommunicate him because it's William knew that Joseph was a polygamist, and Joseph said, I want you to excommunicate the polygamist. No, they're going to take a, a select group of people <laughs> and publicly excommunicate them so that they are now publicly not um, under this pressure. And, and I assume there are people here that are real scriptorians and not me, but I don't believe that there, there's procedures. There were revelations and procedures to uh, remove a member of the First Presidency or yeah. potentially a president of the church. and. William Marks couldn't do that. Okay. So no, he would not be asking William Marks to do that. Okay, other Should we, one more and then we'll uh, Do you have the anything from uh, William and Jane Law that would corroborate, you know, that Joseph is playing different uh, people in different ways? Uh, Who's our expert on William Law yeah. right now? Boy, we need one. <laughs> we do need one. Because he's very interesting. Yeah. Um, it, nothing specific. Okay. Uh, we know that William Law and William Marx were contemporaries. They were in a lot yeah. of the same groups with each other. William Law later uh, describes William Marx as a good man, yeah. uh, one of the good people in Nauvoo. Uh, but it, as far as communications between the two of them, and uh, I can't remember the Peregrine. Peregrine. I can't even say the word. But the 
different groups. I can't remember William and Jane Law moving as many times as Marx did oh. to different well, groups. Yeah, I don't remember the Laws ever did they joining just another stay group. Yeah, they did not join another no, restoration they, group. After. Yeah, they, they were done. He had a big mill, right, in Nauvoo, so he was pretty much doing stuff, making some money. Mm -hmm. and, yep. Okay, well, that will be the next project. All right, <laughs> well, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> So we're going to go on to the book Secret Covenants, and these are new insights on early Mormon polygamy. I am so excited tonight to see Gary Bergera in the audience because he really is the impetus behind this whole project. Yes. So when Gary was at Signature Books before his retirement, he reached out to me to see if I would be interested. And first I have to say that when I became a Mormon historian, I decided that I would never write on feminism or polygamy. I wanted to be known for other things, more serious things, and um, not be pigeonholed into those two things, and it seems like those two things follow me wherever I go. So Gary reached out and said, would I be interested in bringing together a collection of essays on polygamy to put together into a book? And so I agreed to do this, and um, after I agreed, um, I think the original concept of the book is that we would look and find essays that had already been written on polygamy and just bring them together and, you know, compile them. But I decided I know enough people in the Mormon world who, who write on polygamy that maybe we could get some brand new essays and um, this would be more interesting to me to find these people. So I reached out to many of my friends, um, some of whom had written a lot about polygamy, and you know their names, Todd Compton, Don Bradley, um, Devery Anderson, some of these people. And then also some, and Claire Barris was willing to join us as a new, kind of a newcomer. He's um, written a lot about Mormon history in the past, but I think this was maybe a new area for him. And then we had a couple of people who had never published before, um, who I knew were working quite diligently on the subject. And so I asked them all to contribute a chapter to this book. And I think, Gary, did you tell me um, at first that it should be around 200 pages? <laughs> at most. <laughs> right. <laughs> so the book is about 400 pages now. But the thing is, I asked everyone to give me, I don't know, I think I gave them a 20 page, and I wanted them to submit 20 pages, and we had 10 authors. So I thought that that would work well. And then if they had a few more pages, I'd take it. I started getting essays um, of 80 pages. <laughs> yes, Don Bradley gave me an 80 page paper. Um, so it was very, you know, I did my due diligence as an editor. I had to, you know, cut their babies in half, and that was very hard. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, so I did a lot of work on that, and it was so much fun. Um, and I think that. Many of the essays, in the, if not all of the essays in this book, are truly groundbreaking. They're amazing, and they have things in there that you have not heard. Some people say that everything's been said about Mormon polygamy, <laughs> but no. We have so many new things that you've probably never heard. So I would encourage you to get this book and check these essays out. It's so much fun to read because you don't have to read it from page one to page 400, or however many pages, 400, but you can just pick one of the essays and just, you know, read it in probably not a day because they're pretty dense. But um, just pick one essay and read it and let it stew and then um, pick another. And I think that you'll have a lot of fun. So we have a couple of um, the writers of the chapters here t tonight. We have Claire and then I'm going to have John Dinger speak again because he also has a chapter in this book as well. So Claire. hear me okay yes. okay great uh, well I I'm excited to be here uh, I benchmark is is awesome and, I, and I'm happy to be uh, I've come many times and uh, you know I come into the room and I survey the land of books and then I think of the Old Testament scripture 
about that there were giants in the land. <laughs> and then I look over there and there's Chris. And, <laughs> yeah. and sure enough, there are giants in this land. So I, it's uh, fun to be here. And Cheryl, thank you for inviting me uh, to write an essay or to, to dust off of, uh, something I had already done. Uh, when the Gospel <laughs> Topics essays uh, came out, I kind of dove in and, uh, it, you know, and next thing you know, I'm like, oh, look at this revelation that somebody had. And here's another revelation, another revelation. And so I, I compiled something together. So my, my chapter is on the plural marriage, or the marriage revelations of Joseph Smith. And there are far more than I uh, ever dreamed that there would be. There are a lot in there. And they begin in 1829 and they end uh, and the book, my, my chapter goes up to 1844, covering this broad spectrum. And I include uh, some of the things I'm a little, so, so I, I take the revelation, and the revelation has to be document, there has to be documentation for it before Joseph Smith's death. That was the rule that I incorporated. There are a lot of mentions of Joseph Smith's plural marriage revelations after his death. They go way beyond. And I do spend a few paragraphs talking about those and uh, plus uh, all of the other revelations that are in there. And, and what, what, one of the things that, uh, that I concluded after kind of a statistical sense of how many of his wives and how many of them have revelations tied to, to them, plus some of the rhetoric that comes out about revelation and plural marriage, is I am convinced that Joseph Smith had a revelation for every proposal that he uttered. Okay? I, I, I'm convinced of that, and I, and I write about that in the chapter and, and give my rationale for that. Uh, so, so my chapter begins in uh, 1829, I, I call the Book of Mormon a revelation because sometimes those plates weren't even in the room and Joseph is <laughs> translating. So, and he's got the rock or the, 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 the seer stone. And so, um, you know, Jacob too, which uh, can be read more than one way. And I talk about how it can be read multiple ways. And then Brigham Young uh, says he remembers that there was a revelation at the time that Jacob too came out Oliver and Joseph knelt down, prayed about it, and that's where the original plural marriage revelation came from. And then Oliver, and he says, then Oliver got carried away and ran off with some gal, and you know, everything went downhill for Oliver, according to Brigham Young. I, I don't know what to make of that, but this is how the story begins, and how this the story of these revelations go. And they go on and on and on. Um, there's, uh, I talk a bit about the translations that Joseph Smith did uh, uh, in the Bible, the biblical translations, and what happens when he's talking about Abraham and some of these other patriarchs that had multiple wives, and what does happen and what doesn't happen. I talk about other uh, translations in the Bible or him talking about his interpretation of Scripture where he alludes to kind of a, uh, what Michael Quinn calls a theocratic epic, which is a different way of looking at things, and it kind of opens the door, I think, for plural marriage down the road in Joseph Smith's mind. And early on in the Kirtland era, you can see, I think, you can see Joseph Smith's wheels kind of turning uh, and thinking about this that later will kind of blossom in the Nauvoo era. Um, uh, let's see, uh, yeah, and, and I talk about other things that aren't um, revelations, but such as the canonized 1835 statement on marriage, where he says, polygamy is the thing, or polygamy is not the thing. Those rumors you're hearing about, pay no attention to them, um, we're, we're monogamous. And, and I think, I kind of think that might be a hint that maybe there was some stuff going on or some thinking going on in that direction. And so some of the things aren't specific revelations, but that's a canonized item. Some are about tra or translations. Uh, but then when we get into the Nauvoo era, 
he begins having very specific revelations to marry women uh, and and they're fascinating and uh, and at the end I, uh, I I document every revelation and then at the end I do a kind of a thematic analysis and I look at the different themes that go across the various revelations that he had I talk about how they tie into DNC 132 and there's really some fascinating uh, things that bubble up and that come out of these various revelations and the backstories in them. And, and then they fit very neatly into a lot of the concepts that are in DNC 132. And I found it personally quite fascinating. So um, and then, you know, the last one I'll mention very briefly, it's kind of a fun one, uh, which is uh, in 1843, I think later on, and, and uh, William Clayton has married two wives and he wants to marry uh, he's married two sisters. He wants to marry a third sister, and uh, and this is in William Clayton's journal. And uh, William Clayton goes to Joseph Smith, and Joseph says, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's pretty close. He says, "I've had an item of law revealed to me lately that if a man takes more than two sisters uh, of the same family, that there's apt to be um, difficult wrangles and something else, but wrangles." <laughs> You can have wrangles if you have too many sisters together. And, and, this is, and he says this is an, an item of law specifically for William, but other, he says, but if there's a special revelation, it's okay to have multiple, to have two, more than two sisters, but it requires a special revelation. So little, little tidbits like that to kind of come out of this. Well, and then Joseph says, oh, by the way, since you're not marrying her, do you mind if I marry her and uh he's like yeah sure i'll ask for you and then she says no i'm, I'm not interested but uh, anyway that's a to z the spectrum of revelations and and like i said i found it fascinating it overviews joseph smith's it's a spotty story of all of joseph smith's plural marriage but it's spotty because it's only about the revelations but after you've read that chapter i think you kind of have a general sense of the whole thing and I think it's a helpful introduction to the book because it the others are specific time point points in time along that bigger <coughs> story so anyway that's that's a bit about my chapter so. You've probably heard enough from me, so I won't talk too long. Um, I say this with all the love in my heart, but if you are at a book signing uh, on your off time, you are a nerd, right? <laughs> <laughs> we are all nerds, okay? And again, yes, proudly. Uh, but then there is a subset of our nerds who are really nerdy, right? And that's my essay. Okay, I like the common law. I like to talk about the common law, right? So that that just whew, probably a little uncomfortable with me here. But anyway, uh, my my essay is called Nauru Polygamy in the Law: Statutory and Common Law Prohibitions. So I assume half of you are asleep. So wake up. Um, but but mine is uh, what I do here is uh, I try to to correct a couple of things that I've been seeing and, and trends that I don't really like in history. And the first is, I pretty painstakingly, maybe a little too painstakingly, uh, go through all the laws that kind of deal with this uh, in Nauvoo at the time. So it is not just as simple as saying polygamy is illegal and a crime, right? Uh, I go through and I analyze all the marriage laws, I analyze adultery and fornication, and I analyze polygamy both in the statutes as were passed by the Illinois legislature, but then I also look at the common law uh, and how that could have applied as well. Uh, and so I, you are all sitting there thinking this is so exciting. <laughs> if you're one of those nerds, it is. Okay, so uh, the reason I do this is I, I see some, some trends and some problems uh, and things that, that I, don't, I don't love. Uh, I, I, there's a lot of apologists who really try hard to prove, it's very important to them, that Joseph Smith never committed a crime, whether he was convicted or even committed a crime. 
Uh, and so some apologists in their way of doing this, I think it's creating problems uh, and sort of lending to people thinking that he never lived polygamy. Uh, and so I look at all of this as sort of a, we need to look at it with a legal framework. So in there, I, I kind of talk about that. So there's, there's, I start out with talking about John Thorpe and Sarah Miller. Uh, it, it, in fact, let me just kind of read this here. So on January 17, 1843, John Thorpe and Sarah Miller were summoned to the Nauvoo High Council on charges of living in adultery. And they were summoned by William Marks, another plug for the other book. Uh, <laughs> while Miller was a widow and unmarried, Thorpe had a living wife in Nauvoo at the time, but still pursued and married Miller in December of 1842. When the day of the hearing arrived, Miller appeared with Thorpe's legal wife, but Thorpe did not. So the two women show up. Um, that must have been fun. Uh, he did, however, send word that he would not be attending the hearing as, quote, he was afraid that he would be arrested by the civil law and sent to the penitentiary for bigamy. And so there was a fear of being arrested, of being prosecuted. I go through and I discuss the cases during the Saints time in Illinois where people were in fact indicted and charged for polygamy, for adultery. Uh, and all of that. Uh, and I walk through that uh, and kind of talk about how it's important. Um, I address some of uh, the concerning apologetic arguments that I have regarding Joseph Smith's denials, um, where he says, you know, I, I've only been married once. And they say, well, look at him. Uh, he has only been married once. These aren't legal marriages. And, and I'll go through with common law and show that, well, actually, under the common law, they are. Uh, and so, it's really, uh, I'm just trying to get people to be a little more nuanced, a little more precise when they talk about laws, how it affects it, and really look at things with that potential of criminal prosecution and so why these polygamists and Joseph Smith acted in the way that he did and made the denials in the ways that he did. Yeah. <clears throat> at your appetite. Um, I'm going to read you some of the, what some of the other chapters and authors who they are. So um, Claire is chapter one. Chapter two is by Mark Tenthmeyer and he is a new author. This is his first pub published work and he talks about old women's tales versus the historical verification of Joseph Smith's polygamy. So he tries to gather all of the contemporary accounts of Joseph Smith's polygamy and put them together and um, make a case that Joseph did practice polygamy. Um, chapter three is by Christopher C. Smith, a revelation to get him a wife. Joseph Smith's marriage proposals to Emma Hale and to prospective plural wives. So we know a lot about Joseph Smith's proposals to women, but we don't always think about his proposal to Emma. And, and Chris goes into that one, it's quite interesting. Um, Don Bradley has written a chapter called Dating Fanny L. Alger, The Chronology and Consequences of a Proto-Polygamous Relationship. So he is in a kind of a cute way talking about the chronology of, ha of how the Fanny Alger um, experience happened so that we can, we've had difficulty in the past dating exactly when that happened. Did it happen before or after Elijah's visitation and such? So he writes this, this chapter. And then um, Don Bradley and Christopher Smith decided they didn't have, they had a little bit more to say after they each wrote a chapter. So they teamed up and wrote another chapter. And I allowed that. And it's called Of Generations and Genders. Fanny Alger and the Adoptive Origins of Ritual Sealing. This is the bombshell, I think, that, um, that they have looked at this relationship in a way that no one ever has before. Susan Staker has written a chapter called Magus and Goodwife on the Road to Secret Nauvoo. She compares Abraham and Sarah with Joseph and Emma. Um, John Dinger is, is chapter seven. Todd Compton has written, were there eternity only plural marriages in Nauvoo? So he addresses that question. Some have thought, well, maybe some of the marriages um, that Joseph Smith had were not for this life and he wasn't sleeping with these women. It was eternity only marriages. And Todd addresses this and finds that that was probably not happening. Um, 
Marianne Clements is also one of our new authors. She is a certified genealogist, and she has an amazing way of looking at the polygamy story. She has written about Theodore Turley's Nauvoo Plural Marriages, a collection of Clifts, and it's about three sisters whose last name was Clift, and she talks about each of their motivations for entering plural marriage. Uh, Devery Anderson has written Willard Richards' Nauvoo Plural Marriages, Polygamy Most Peculiar. And he shows how Willard Richards' marriages are really just kind of parallel many of Joseph Smith's marriages, which are different than um, kind of the Brighamite polygamy that we normally think of. I have a chapter called, That's Just the Hell of It, Accounting for Emma Smith's Denial of Her Husband's Plural Marriages. Why did Emma Smith, throughout her life, continue to deny that her husband ever practiced polygamy. And then we conclude with William Victor Smith, who writes a brief influence biography of Joseph Smith's July 12, 1843, Revelation on Marriage, which of course is DNC 132. And he talks about that and its implications then and now. So doesn't that sound fascinating? Isn't it something that you really want to get your hands on? So do we have any questions about this book, Secret Covenants? Okay, Michelle. <laughs> if you were doing it again, what what additional or what you, like you've mentioned before that the discussion has changed? Are there any changes you would make or anything you wish you would have included or? Okay, out? so I've mentioned in several places that this book um, had its beginning about two years ago, and at that time I was not aware that there was um, a controversy. Um, that the controversy was not as strong at that time of whether Joseph Smith, whether or not Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. Most of all, us all just assumed that he was a polygamist, and we knew that, right? But now people are calling into question whether Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. So many of these essays, I think, do not address that at all. We just assume that he's a polygamist. And I think that if I wrote it today, I would be a little bit more uh, particular in making the authors prove, you know, that, um, and bring forth their documentation um, in a way to show that, not just assume that Joseph practiced it, but to actually make a stronger case for that, if that makes sense. 800 page book. <laughs> Maybe a little longer. I yes. thought I have the advantage of having read the book. Um, the author from Texas is the first time who was documenting everybody who was denying polygamy you know, there's a couple named Price who have written three volumes that have proved that Joseph Smith, did, with documentation, that Joseph, I mean, when he wrote that chapter, it was like, he's way beyond the nerd within the nerd within the, and it's yes, like. Yes, and he does address some of the, um, some of the criticisms that the Price is bringing All out. of the criticisms. Yeah. I and mean, that so, should. So he is, his chapter, I think, addresses this controversy more than any of the other chapters. It's, it's amazing. The whole book is amazing. I mean, seriously, that, and I'm, it's a great book. I used to have 6,000 books, but most of them are here now, so. How's that? <laughs> okay, thank you. On the other hand, are you, <clears throat> are you suggesting that the authors of this particular book and the compendium are not providing references for the data that they are presenting? So it's impossible to cross-reference what they're saying. Is that what you're saying? No, no I mean, I, I think that the, the book a, is very apropos to the um, the controversy, but you can't use it as, you know, I wouldn't say um, to someone who's have, who's questioning whether Joseph Smith practiced polygamy that this book will give them all the answers. I mean, Mark Tensmeyer's chapter comes pretty close, I, right? I, I, <laughs> I'd say that, you know, it's, it's more than adequate. I read the book, buy the book. <laughs> but the whole, the whole idea, just like John's, the one reference out of that book that goes into the Marx book, which I've always had the advantage to read also, as soon as you see that there's a grand jury process working in Hancock County, and you see the names, all of a sudden it's not just everybody's hating each other. It's everybody like William Marx particularly is saying, okay, look, we have some precedents, the common law, all that type now, it didn't, and today doesn't always work, but it's very fascinating to see that level heads sometimes, you know, 
role, but quite often they come out looking pretty good, which yeah. right now William Marks is yeah, thank you. two thumbs so, up. So sir, kind of to answer it, yeah. when the book was, when we were asked, it was just new research on polygamy, right? That's what the chapters are. They weren't written in a way to disprove this new group that is saying Joseph Smith didn't practice it. What I took Cheryl to say was, with that controversy going on and this coming out now, maybe she would have asked us to add a bit more about that in there, but but mine already did. Yeah. So, so we need another book. No, no. <laughs> I, uh, you know, when Signature asks, I'll read another chapter. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Signature calls, I pick up, right? There's, there's always more to say about Mormon polygamy. It's weird. <laughs> it, it, I, and I was uh, at least somewhat aware of that. I, like, like I mentioned, I didn't include any revelation that wasn't documented before Joseph Smith's lifetime, and I made that criteria. And I had to, and I had to leave a lot on the, the cutting table. I also talk a lot about the sources and the quality of sources that I use. And so I, I tried to have an awareness of that. And I, and I suspect, uh, I, I think the other authors did too. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have one in the back there. Yeah, kind of a two questions, a shorter one for Claire. Um, you brought up the Jacob chapter two. I'm curious, the interpretation of it supporting plural marriage in some situations, do we have an earlier incidence of that coming up before like Orson Pratt in the 1850s? I, I didn't look at when people were using that interpretation. I just talk about what to me was the common interpretation that I grew up with, which was uh, plural marriage is, uh, or monogamy is the standard unless God wants to raise a righteous generation. However, and, and, and this is me paying attention to the uh, critics who say that Joseph Smith perhaps did not practice plural marriage, I listened to their arguments about Jacob chapter two, and, and I believe they have a good point. It can be parsed in more than one way. The, the syntax is all over the place. If an English teacher was grading that, <laughs> it would not, they'd say, rewrite that because I don't know what you're saying. And so I think that can be read in two ways and, and we need to realize that there's more than one way to read that. And my uh, second question, I think actually involves all of you, because um, it comes up in your chapter and then in the Mark, um, Mark, William Mark's book, as well about uh, some of the sources, particularly later stuff from Sarah Pratt, um, saying that Joseph Smith early on would claim to have a relation to have sex with the women but not necessarily be married to them. I was wondering if like, you could comment on, do the sources, are there reliable sources that support that idea? Uh, let me, yeah, I do bring that up. Uh, Sarah Pratt does say that in Utah much later. John Bennett says that also. And you have to ask the question with Sarah, she, she was not happy with polygamy and her husband continuing to chase after young girls and so forth and so on. So was she saying that out of spite and anger to get one in on Joseph Smith? Or was she remember, is that, was she legitimately remembering it the way? She's one of the earlier people that are proposed to, and so she uh, probably had some insight into that. In my chapter, I talk about uh, Margaret Nyman and, um, oh boy, <laughs> and another woman who have, who give testimony, and they testify that uh, Joseph Smith asked them to have, that Joseph had a revelation that it was okay to have sexual relations without a ceremony. And I have two cases that are documented. Now, there are questions about the sources, and we have to discuss the sources and the reliability, but I think it's a question that needs to be asked. The, the one other thing I would point out is that Joseph Smith did give a sermon about uh, a chapter in Matthew where the woman is found in adultery and they're gonna stone her, and then Jesus, you know, he says, where are thine accuser? I don't accuse you, blah, blah, blah. Joseph says, then Joseph goes on, it says, if there are no accusers, then there, then there's no sin. And in the in the context of a man and a woman having a relationship or an adulterous relationship. 
And it's a really curious thing. And then Bennett goes on and some of his cohorts, and they use that for justification for their uh, non-ceremony relationships. But they're quoting Joseph Smith, and they're accurately quoting him. So you've got to ask, what did Joseph mean when he said this? And it's in, I think, 1841, right at the beginning, when all this stuff is starting to take off. So that, that's my two cents on the matter. So I, I'm going to push back on you a little bit. Sure. So in those testimony, none of the women say Joseph Smith told them. It was all secondhand. The, the men who were trying to get these women to engage with them said Joseph Smith told me. Correct? I'm going to push back on both of you. Okay. <laughs> because because um, it wasn't, they weren't, so the women didn't say Joseph Smith. It was sanctioned by Joseph Smith. They said it was sanctioned by church leaders. Correct? Okay, fair enough. Well, it, let me push back. Uh, <laughs> Isn't this fun? <laughs> uh, and, and I guess we could open up the book and read, read out of it. But I, I think they specifically allude to Joseph Smith, but I need to double check that. I, I guess we all, yeah. So uh, we would need to dub, double check it, but um, I, I, that's how I interpret it. Sure. It's just that none of the women themselves say Joseph themselves said this to him. That, that's where I'm kind of pushing back. Um, it was it, William, right, who said that? William, right. William did. They did bring in Joseph's brother, William. So he, he actually was there. Um, I get pushed back on this all the time. Uh, but I see a very different system of polygamy with John C. Bennett's spiritual withery than Joseph Smith's. Mm -hmm. So th that's where I would kind of push back and contend with Sarah Pratt. I do see a difference. And, and, sorry, I get it. Just I'm remembering. <laughs> you get the last word. <laughs> I'm remembering uh, more of the testimony. I think it's uh, uh, Nyman, and she's being queried about relationships and who and you're you've been told to be secret about it and and then they and she's having relations and then she finally is asked who is the one that that told you this and who's the third person that you slept with and then she says joseph and and then she says and then they, the inquisitor says no, 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 stop we've had enough you have to testimony. buy that it's all in here <laughs> this is and this is a John C. Bennett reproduction, which may be in your book, but it's not in the Nauvoo High Council, I don't believe. I, but the, the Nyman sisters were. Okay, maybe. Okay. Yeah. The okay. Nyman sisters, uh, uh, Sarah Miller, uh, she testified. Sarah Miller, yes. Um, all right, let me, let me find it. But this is the book you want, and it's on sale, guys. <laughs> this has all of the testimony. And I don't know how far we want to go with this, but it's awesome. <laughs> Three of us are up here looking this, at our this books. Is what, okay, let me say, let me just say, this is what made this project so much fun because there was a lot of this going on behind the scenes, right? So I wanted all of our uh, chapters to be coherent. I didn't really want them to to um, clash too much, although it's fun to see little differences of opinion. So we had a lot of this back and forth that was going on. What really happened? Let's go back to the documents. Let's see. And it was a lot of fun. And it's the, the fun never stops, does it? <laughs> you find it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the quiz. She's being, she's being queried. Um, this is Nyman? Yes, Margaret Nyman. And, uh, and, and she's giving information about sexual relationships and then uh uh and then the uh, she says uh it is not necessary it, oh it is it is not uh, name him she says and she says it is not necessary i am under covenant inquisitor you must answer joseph directed us to absolve all covenants margaret says i would rather defer until i can consult the person the inquisitor says joseph knows all about it it has been revealed to him by god and if you do not reveal it, the curse will fall upon you, and you must tell. And then she says, it was Joseph. And then the Inquisitor says, stand aside. You need not tell that. <laughs> so that's, yeah. Very okay. good. Claire. All right. Way to go, Very Claire. Good. You Claire. haven't lost it. <laughs> All right. So um, are we ready to end? Or have you... one more question? Okay, or we have like three more questions. Oh.
Oh, we're at 7.30, so we probably need to wrap up. Yeah. Okay, so, um, thank you. I, I, um, so, uh, Claire, are you, say, are, are you addressing concubinage? You know, have, and has anybody really addressed concubinage? Mm. You know, because we've... <laughs> well, right, and, and these non-ceremony relationships, I, I, I bring that question up. Could this be the concubinage or concubinage, however you say that, that is mentioned in DNC 132, which is mentioned by Joseph, and then it's just starkly dropped, and we're like, what, what was going on? <laughs> but we have, we have this spiritual woofery, or what the John C. Bennett style spiritual woofery, and maybe that's it. I, I don't know, but I, I propose that and say, it's something we ought to think about. Yeah. being here appreciate it please uh come and grab a book so you can do your homework on all these great questions if you'll just put up your chairs up against the closest uh, fixture and have a refresh